Okay, welcome back everyone to ninth grade ancient and medieval history. So this is your lecture for the 26th of March on the High Middle Ages. So we're going to start uh, with a prayer and then we will get down to business. And since we are in the Middle Ages now, we will do uh, one of St. Francis's prayers. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. All right, so uh, our subject for today is life in the high middle ages. And uh, we've entered a new unit of the course now, so we have left the early middle ages and we have moved on to the next third of the Middle Ages that we call the High Middle Ages. And the High Middle Ages is gonna be the penultimate uh, period that we examine this year. And uh, it's the subject of both chapters nine and chapters 10 of your Spielvogel textbook. So we generally say that the High Middle Ages last from the year 1000 to the year 1300. So remember we divide the Middle Ages up into three pieces. Uh, into the early Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages, and the Late Middle Ages. And the High Middle Ages uh, is the middle period of the Middle Ages. So what makes the High Middle Ages a distinct period? Why talk about it separately from the early Middle Ages, which we've been talking about prior to this point? Well, uh, to start with, we see increased stability in Europe. If you remember, when we talked about the early Middle Ages, we talked about all of these invasions of Europe, invasions by Muslims, invasions by Magyars, uh, invasions by all manner of Goths, invasions by Vandals, uh, invasions by the Vikings. Uh, by the High Middle Ages, all of those things have pretty much stopped. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that Europe is much more stable in the High Middle Ages. Uh, in addition to that, we also see increasing political stability. So if you think about our Frankish kingdoms that we talked about, if you think about um, Clovis, or you think even about Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, how these kings are always breaking up their kingdoms and dividing them into different pieces for their sons. Uh, we're not going to see that happen anymore. We are going to see good, stable, long-lasting kingdoms develop instead. And uh, the states that we see emerge in the High Middle Ages will be the ancestors of quite a number of our modern European states. Um, yeah, this is when we can really talk about a kingdom of England, when we can talk about a kingdom of France. And those are two countries that are basically uh, practically the same today. Obviously, you know, France isn't a monarchy anymore, but the country we call France is the same country we're going to call France uh, in this time period. Uh, and we also see uh, a certain intellectual flowering and new creativity as well. Um, yeah, if you remember, we talked about the early Middle Ages. We talked about the Carolingian Renaissance. There are a number of these little mini Renaissances in the Middle Ages. Uh, and we see uh, another one of these mini Renaissances in the High Middle Ages. Uh, and so we see Europeans begin to rediscover Aristotle by way of the Muslims. Uh, we see the founding of many of Europe's oldest universities. Uh, we see new vernacular literature, um, you know, literature that, that some of you are probably familiar with, like the tales of King Arthur. Um, so stories about knights, stories about troubadours. Um, yeah, these are all things that we're going to talk about in, in coming lessons. Um, but what I want to focus on with you today is uh, not on some of these cultural things or the political things but uh, on what life is like for regular people who are living in the high middle ages. So one of the big changes that we see in the high middle ages is that the population of Europe is increasing. 
uh, the population of Europe as a whole pretty much doubles in the high Middle Ages. Uh, Europe goes from about 38.5 million people at the start of the high Middle Ages to about 73 and a half million by the late Middle Ages, which is not too shabby for a period of history. It's about 300 years long. Um, I guess 340 if we use the numbers from your textbook here. By the way, as you're looking at these numbers here, you can see they're broken down by different regions of Europe, the Mediterranean, uh, Western and Central Europe, Eastern Europe. And if you remember in class yesterday, one of the things that we were discussing was the Peren thesis. And it's one of the things we'll be discussing again tomorrow in class. But look at these numbers for a minute here and think about how they would either support or how they would refute Peren's arguments about the shifting balance of power in the European world. Remember, Peren says that with the Muslim invasions, the Mediterranean's unity is broken and the Mediterranean's grip on the rest of Europe is loosened. So do these changing populations in the Mediterranean versus Western and Central Europe seem to support Peren's argument or do they cut against it? It's definitely something I'll ask you tomorrow. So it's apparent that these numbers are rising, but the question then is why? What is going on to cause these numbers to rise? So we do have a few answers for this. Some of these are things that we just talked about. This is a much more stable period of time. Um, we don't have a bunch of Viking invasions. We don't have that kind of conflict anymore. Um, stability makes it easier for people to stay alive um, and results in the population increasing. Uh, we have greater security, we have greater stability. Another important change uh, that's happening is actually a climate change. Um, the weather in Europe gets a little bit warmer in the high Middle Ages. And because the weather is a little bit warmer, that means that uh, it allows for longer growing seasons. Uh, longer growing seasons, better weather means more crops. More crops means we can feed more people, which means the population increases. Uh, this better, we better weather, excuse me, is also coupled with some important new changes in agricultural technology and in farming techniques. So first off, we see the introduction of uh, a new type of plow, what we call the heavy plow. So since uh, the time of the Romans, people in Western Europe have been using a type of plow that we call the aratrum, uh, or we call it the light plow. So uh, it's a plow that's made of wood and it has this little uh, hook on the end, as you can see here. Uh, the hook turns up the soil uh, and then you plant your seeds. Uh, it's relatively lightweight, although in, in the picture on the bottom there, it's pulled by a team of oxen. Uh, it can easily uh, be pulled by a single horse or a single ox or a single donkey. Uh, and in all honesty, plowing technology has not changed very much since the time of the ancient Greeks. Uh, if you look at the picture in the top right of the slide, you have an ancient Greek depiction of someone plowing a field. And honestly, uh, there is not a big technological difference between what that man is doing and what our peasants are doing in the early Middle Ages. So the Eratrum, it's a perfectly good, perfectly serviceable way to plow a field, but it works much better in the Mediterranean than it does in Northern Europe. Uh, the soils in Northern Europe are much heavier. They have more clay in them than the soil in the Mediterranean. And that means that a light plow like the Eratrum does not do the best job of turning up the soil. Um, really, the solution would be to have a heavy plow, and that's exactly what we see in the high Middle Ages. So we see the creation of what we call the karuka, or the heavy plow. So the karuka is made from iron, uh, and typically it also has wheels to speed the plow through the field. Uh, so because it is heavier, uh, it can break up the heavier Northern European soils much better than the light plow, than the Eratrum. And the iron, of course, also makes it stronger, makes it tougher. 
the problem is though now that it's heavier, even though it does have these wheels to speed the plow, this is no longer something that you can do with a single horse or a single ox. Um, you definitely need a team of oxen or horses to pull this thing. Um, quite often, in fact, you'll see teams of six or eight oxes teamed up to one of these heavy plows, one of these aratrums to push it, or sorry, one of these karuka to push it through the soil. Uh, so, you know, on the one hand, this may seem like a relatively obvious invention, right? Let's make a plow out of metal instead of wood because it will plow better. But it's worth mentioning that in European history, just because our, our people in, in most of Europe are now using a heavy plow, uh, the Russians for the most part are still using wooden plows until the 20th century. Um, it's not really uh, until after the Russian Revolution that they begin to use metal plows in Russia, which is kind of a shocking fact. Uh, there are also some other important uh, inventions and technological changes that go together with the Karuka that also make plowing uh, easier. Uh, one of these is that we have a new type of horse collar. Um, so you can see in the picture, you've got these uh, collars around the horses. So traditionally, uh, before the high middle ages, the kinds of collars, the kinds of yokes that were used on horses were basically like the kind of leash you would use on a dog. So they've got these collars that are rather tightly around their neck. And as the horses or the oxen are pulling through the field, the collar is pushing up against their neck also kind of strangling them. And that's okay when you have a light plow like the Aratrum, but when you have a heavy plow like a Karuka, it's not really very good that they're pushing all of this weight with their neck. Uh, so instead we had the invention of the horse collar. So instead of them having a leash that's around their neck like a dog, they've got a, a collar where they're pushing the weight with their shoulders instead of with their neck. Uh, so the horse collar puts the weight on the shoulders, not the neck, making it easier for your horse or for your ox or for whatever to pull uh, your plow. Coupled together with that, another thing that we probably take for granted is the usage of horseshoes. Um, so, you know, you put the shoes in the horse's hoofs, it gives the horses better traction, better traction also helps them to pull the plow. Um, you know, just like if you're doing serious work moving things, you probably want to wear some sneakers with good traction on them. You probably don't want to be doing that barefoot. So these things make plowing better. In addition to straight up new inventions like the heavy plow and like the horse collar, there are also some different agricultural practices that we're going to adapt that will make agriculture more efficient. And uh, this largely has to do with what we call crop rotation. So uh, typically in the early Middle Ages, a village would divide its fields into two groups. On half of their fields, they would grow crops. And on the other half, they would leave the field what we call fallow or empty. So in a world where they don't really have the kinds of modern chemical fertilizers that we do today, after you grow something like wheat on a field, there's not really enough nutrients in that field to grow a crop in the field the next year. Uh, if you want to continue to grow uh, a crop that requires a lot of nutrients in the soil, you need to give the soil a year off for the nitrogen and the other nutrients in the soil to redevelop. So when you give the field time off, when you leave it empty, you leave that field fallow. So what we do is half of the fields we plant with crops, the other half we leave fallow. And so after we've done this for one year, the field over here that had crops before uh, is going to become our fallow field. And this fallow field, which we didn't grow anything on last year, will now be where we plant our crops. Um, and yeah, there's nothing wrong with doing this. It works, but it's highly inefficient. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, what this means essentially is that any given time, 50% of your land is not actually going to be planted because it needs to be left fallow. Um, yeah, and this kind of idea of crop rotation, it's very old. We can trace it back to, to the Romans. Uh, but in the high middle ages, we start to see a new model of crop rotation come into usage. So instead of using two fields, we're now going to use three fields. 
So whereas in the early Middle Ages, we divided our land into three or two fields, excuse me, now we divide it into three parts. On one part of our land, we plant wheat. On another part of our land, we plant oats. And the last third, we leave fallow. So uh, wheat is very important, right? Wheat is what you get flour from. Flour is where you get bread from. Bread is still the main thing that Europeans are eating in this time period. The problem is wheat is a crop that requires a lot of nutrients from the soil. And once you've grown wheat, as we said before, you can't grow anything else in that field the next year. <clears throat> what do Europeans have discovered though is oats, uh, also an important grain, an important cereal crop, they can be planted in the field that you've planted wheat in the year before. So uh, oats do uh, are able to work in that field. So our first year, our fields look like this, right? Wheat, oats, fallow. The second year, the wheat goes to the field that we left fallow. It goes to that field that is refreshed. Our oats then go to the field that had wheat in it the year before because there is enough nutrients left in the soil to grow wheat. And our field, which had been oats before, is now totally wasted, uh, totally useless. So we need to make that our fallow field. So. Uh, Wheat goes to fallow, oats go to wheat, and the fallow field is the field that we planted our oats in the previous year. And then we just keep rotating the cycle every three years. Uh, and this is a much more efficient system because now instead of leaving half of our land fallow, we're only leaving a third of our land fallow, which means we can plant more crops, which means we can feed more people. <clears throat> There is another big important agricultural development that we need to talk about in this period, and that is what we call a sarting. Uh, a sarting really gets started uh, around 1100 AD. So in the early Middle Ages, basically uh, everyone is, is kind of starving, trying desperately to get enough food to eat. Um, you know, there is not a lot of food to go around. Um, things are pretty unstable. By the high Middle Ages, when things have gotten better, um, the weather is better, we can get more crops from the exact same land. The population is increasing. Uh, and so as the population increases, we also need more food. It's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, and as we have more crops, we have more people, and as we have more people, we need even more crops. And so what happens is we need more and more land to be cleared to grow enough food to feed everyone. And this process of clearing land and turning it into fields is what we call a sarding. So a sarding is turning land into fields for farming, clearing trees, clearing brush, whatever needs to happen to make that land uh, something that you can farm, to make that land suitable for agriculture. The problem that we have in the high middle ages is that land is in short supply. Um, yeah, that's why we need to engage in this process of a sarding. Uh, labor, on the other hand, is something that we have plenty of. And this is what really ingrains feudalism. Right, because there are plenty of people to work the land, but there is not a lot of land that can be worked because land is what is in short supply, not labor. This really deeply ingrains feudalism in European society. Um, this is why we have serfs. People are willing to be tied to the land because they desperately need land to farm. There is not a lot of it to go around. Um, you know, they cannot afford to make a lot of demands. It is not uh, a market where they have a lot of power. It's a market where the people who own the land have all the power. So if you remember, one of the things I was kind of angry with Jackson Spielvogel about when we talked about the early Middle Ages is he talks a lot about feudalism in his chapter on the early Middle Ages. And while it's certainly true that feudalism begins in the early Middle Ages, it's really much more typical of the high Middle Ages. In the early Middle Ages, because there's not a lot of stability, because things are so crazy, it's very hard to tie people to the land the way serfs are tied to the land. And we don't really have the same extreme shortage of land in the early Middle Ages that we do in the high Middle Ages. So feudalism doesn't really become as big a thing until the high Middle Ages.
Uh, so to give you some further evidence of this, here are some aerial photographs of some English fields in the Mendip Hills. So if you watch a lot of TV on the History Channel or Discovery Channel, the big kind of exciting thing to do in archaeology these days is to use LIDAR to peel back the layers of trees and find ancient ruins. Uh, with the advent of aviation in European history, uh, and as you know, it became much easier for people to, to rent out planes and things, uh, one of the things in the 20th century that became very popular to do in English archaeology was to do kind of aerial archaeology, to take aerial photographs and try and find features that had been lost. Uh, and this is one of these pictures that is taken in England from, uh, I believe, the 70s. Uh, and this is a picture of some abandoned medieval fields. So if we look at the picture, you can see these kind of outlines here, uh, these kind of ridges, these kind of mounds. Uh, those are the remnants of old fields that were used in the high middle ages. Um, those would kind of be the boundary lines between some of the strips of, of different land within the fields themselves. Uh, and one of the things that happens in the high middle ages is people are so desperate for land that they start planting, they start using a lot of land, starting a lot of land that was really not very good farming land to begin with. Uh, all the best land has already been turned into farmland a long time ago. And so this is land that's really not very good. The soil isn't very rich. Uh, maybe it's too rocky, maybe it's too hilly. For whatever reason, it's not very good soil. But in the high middle ages, because the population is increasing, we are so desperate to have more land that we are turning land that really probably shouldn't be uh, farms into farms, into fields for crops. Uh, and so after uh, the high middle ages, uh, once things like the plague hit and the population goes down, many of these fields that were used in the high middle ages are abandoned and they're never used again in English history. Uh, and so these pictures here, rather this picture of these fields in the Mendip Hills, these are some of these fields that were used in the high middle ages, uh, abandoned when the population decreased in the late middle ages, and because they're not very good land in the first place, were never uh, farmed as extensively again as they were. And we can see uh, these old kind of uh, ridges and things that are left over from the high middle ages. Okay, so I wanna switch gears now and I wanna talk about what life is like for our average people, for our peasants. Uh, we are going to talk an awful lot um, next week about what life is like for our aristocrats, but it's a little bit more complicated, so we're going to save that for a separate lesson. So, uh, the life of our peasant revolves around basically two things. It revolves around the seasons, the agricultural seasons, and it revolves around the church. Uh, the vast majority of people throughout European history until the Industrial Revolution live in small agricultural communities. And that is just as true of the high middle ages as it is of say 1500 or of 800 AD. Uh, and so the main things that give rhythm to their life are the seasons, right? You do different things at different seasons on a farm, you plant, you harvest. Um, so it's shaped by that and it's also shaped by the church. The reason the church is so important because essentially the only days that you get off are religious holidays. Um, so, of course, every Sunday you're not working because you should be going to mass. So that's one less day a week you're working. Uh, and then really all of the holidays uh, uh, are, are big, you know, church events, obviously Christmas and Easter. Um, but there are plenty of other religious holidays as well, or feast days uh, that take away from your working time. Generally, depending on where you live in Europe, you get about 50 days off a year for religious holidays. So again, these are the big things like Christmas and Easter, but these are also the kind of uh, uh, holy days of obligation that are still celebrated in the Catholic Church today. Uh, so for example, yesterday was the 25th of March, that is the Feast of the Annunciation. Uh, traditionally in European society before the, uh, uh, before say about uh, the early modern period, this is celebrated not only as the Annunciation, but it's also celebrated as New Year's. Uh, all your other holy days of obligation too. Uh, additionally, 
uh, feast days for regional saints. So whoever the, the patron saint of your country is. So if you're in England, right, you'd get St. George's Day off. Um, you know, perhaps the person who is the, the patron saint of your village or, um, yeah, the patron saint of, of, of uh, uh, you know, the, the country, something else has a deep connection to you like that. So, yeah, depending on where you are, depending on who the particular saints that are, are popular in your region are, you're probably getting about 50 days off a year for that. Uh, in addition to these feast days, in addition to these religious celebrations, uh, of course, your life is, is, is marked by the church, right? Uh, baptisms, weddings, funerals, the church is, is there basically from womb to tomb. Uh, you know, there is some kind of important church event for most of the, the major stages in your life as you kind of grow and mature. Uh, and of course, yeah, these are our big occasions for, for either celebration or for taking time off as well. Um, you know, just like today, when you get married, there is going to be, you know, a big party. There's going to be a feast. Uh, when someone dies, you know, people are, are going to, to take time out of their schedule for a funeral, for a wake. Um, so many of these things, you know, are also why the church is so important, because work is, is stopping for everyone for these events. You know, in a small village, when someone gets married, it, it, it's not like someone getting married in Dallas. The odds are probably everyone knows the bride and the groom and everyone is going to go to the wedding. <clears throat> so if you noticed, I was very careful to say that the church and not Christ is at the center of people's lives. Uh, and I say that because it's very hard for us as historians to judge just how much the average peasant really knows about Christianity and what their actual beliefs really are. Um, and a large part of that is uh, we know that the village priest, the local parish priest in many of these agricultural hamlets was not very well educated. Um, you know, the church can be an avenue for upward mobility for some place, for some people. But uh, being the village priest is pretty much the very bottom of the barrel in terms of the church. Uh, and many of these village priests are often very poorly educated. Um, they are not really up on all the finest and detailed points of Christian doctrine. Uh, and oftentimes we know from, from anecdotal evidence that these village priests are sometimes even illiterate. Uh, so, you know, your average peasant is absolutely illiterate. Uh, so you're not going to be reading the Bible. And if the priest is illiterate, he's not going to be reading the Bible either. Uh, so it's really hard to say how much your average peasant really understands about Christ or God or about a complex doctrine like the Trinity. Um, so the church is certainly the focus of their life. What their particular beliefs are is, is much harder to nail down. All right, so where do our peasants live? Uh, they live typically in little thatched roofed cottages. Um, so you can see some pictures of thatched roofed cottages there on the slide. Uh, oftentimes, you know, the walls are made of what we call wattle and daub here, essentially a bunch of sticks uh, kind of woven uh, around uh, some, some studs, I guess you would say, and then this other, um, you know, mud packed up against the walls. So Though some peasants do have stone cottages like you can see on top. Generally, these cottages uh, are, are quite small. Generally, they are one room. Uh, you know, this is not, you know, like you have a bedroom and your parents have a bedroom and there's a kitchen and there's a bathroom. Literally, we're just talking about a big square or a big rectangle. Um, if you are fortunate to own any livestock, uh, a pig or uh, maybe if you're really lucky uh, a cow or something uh, the animals are most likely going to be taken into the cottage with you for safekeeping because uh, those are, are very valuable things that you don't want to risk anything happening to um, generally speaking right you would have a, 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 a maybe a, a hearth in the middle of the house that would serve for heat, that would serve uh, for cooking as well. And then, and then uh, some kind of chimney uh, on the side or on the top for the smoke to escape through. Not anything really too complicated. Uh, our peasants generally lived in uh, what we call nuclear families. I think we've talked about this before. Uh, a nuclear family is when there's just parents and children living together. 
um, not a, a big extended family. So when the children grow up, the children move out and they start their own households and have their own children. So it's not a, a big multi-generational kind of arrangement. These are small nuclear families. Your typical peasant family probably has between two and three children. Uh, there is kind of a caveat here. So these family sizes are not small because they're using any kind of uh, uh, birth control or practicing any kind of family planning. Uh, just because they only have two or three children doesn't mean that the mother has not given birth to more children than that. Uh, unfortunately, the infant mortality rate is very, uh, very high in, in the pre-modern world. So, uh, you know, a woman may have given birth to, to say, eight children, but only two or three of those children survived infancy. Um, so the, the families are small, not because they're intentionally trying to keep their families small by any means. Um, it's just because infant mortality rates are that high. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, women play a vital role in the peasant household. Uh, first and foremost, their job is to take care of the children, but they also do spinning, they do weaving, so they're making textiles and clothing for the family. Um, and they also do the cooking and they may take care of a small family vegetable garden. Uh, as Spielvogel tells you, a good, uh, well-managed household for these peasants is the difference between starvation and living. Um, so there's a huge burden on the wife to, to raise those vegetables, to scrimp, to make things work so that people don't starve. Um, and yeah, we, we've said this before uh, about other time periods, but it's very true of medieval women as well. Marriage is an economic necessity. Um, it is very hard, if not impossible, for a single woman to support herself. Um, and of course, you know, in a busy season like the harvest, these women will get right out there and they will work alongside the men because that is a time when it's all hands on deck. Crops need to be harvested before uh, they rot in the fields. All right, so what are our peasants eating? Uh, pretty much the same thing as our Franks were eating in the early Middle Ages. Lots of bread, legumes, probably nuts and berries as well. Uh, milk and cheese if they're fortunate enough to own a cow or a goat. Eggs if they're fortunate enough to have chickens. Uh, generally speaking, your family will probably eat meat only twice a year, once on Easter and again on Christmas. Um, the rest of the year, you simply can't afford to eat meat. Um, you know, any livestock you have are, are generally more uh, important, say, if you have a cow for the milk or for the cheese than for eating. Uh, meat is really cost prohibitive for most peasants. Uh, and as for drinking, again, uh, many people are still drinking uh, very low alcohol beer. Uh, just for reference, your average monk uh, drinks about three gallons a day in this period. And remember, this, this isn't like drinking today. This is very, uh, uh, barely alcoholic. This is only alcoholic enough to kill most of the nasty things that are in the water. All right, so uh, we've talked about our, our rural peasants. We should talk about the people who live in towns too. Uh, their life is a bit different from pretty much everyone else's, from life on the manor or, or life in some of these small agricultural hamlets. So if you remember, when we talked about medieval society, so we generally divide medieval society into our three estates, our clergy, our nobles, and everybody else. Um, townspeople, though, don't really fit very well into that traditional hierarchy. They don't really work in that paradigm. Remember, our clergy pray for a living. I mean, townspeople pray like all Christians pray, but they don't pray nonstop. That's not the source of their daily bread. They certainly don't fight like our nobles do. And although they do work, they don't work the same way your average peasant does. They're not plowing a field. They're not necessarily getting their hands dirty in that same way. So we sometimes refer to these townspeople as mediocres, which literally just means middle. Um, this is really the origin of, of when we talk about the middle class in, in modern America. 
um, because they are literally people in the middle, people who do not fit into our established paradigm of medieval society. Uh, we also sometimes call them burghers. Uh, by the way, this is also where we get our word bourgeois and bourgeoisie from in uh, English. We talk about people, uh, bourgeois and bougie and things like that. Um, you know, burgs or boroughs in English. Um, the French is also kind of very similar. Uh, so, during the Middle Ages, uh, trade is reviving, the economy is, is growing. Old cities are outgrowing their city walls. Uh, new city walls are needing to be built. We see the creations of new towns, new burgs or boroughs. Uh, and uh, you yeah, know, we see many of these towns springing up at crossroads um, because trade is passing in two different directions. Or we also see many of them crop up around older medieval castles because these are places of security. Um, walls are still very important for protection, even though we're not suffering the kind of invasions that we were in the early Middle Ages. So life for our burghers is very different than it is for our peasants in the countryside. Uh, and this is because burghers, because townspeople typically have special rights, uh, freedoms, we would say. So generally all townspeople have the right to buy and sell property freely. Townspeople also are not obliged to provide military or other labor service. So if you remember when we talked about serfs, we said our serf has to work in the Lord's field a couple days a week. Our serf often has to perform manual labor in other ways for our Lord. Our serf can be called up to serve in the infantry for the Lord of the manor. Uh, our burghers, our, our residents of the cities are free from those kinds of, of requirements. Uh, and in fact, serfs who run away from their manor and who flee to a town uh, are considered to be free if they can hide out in the town for a year and a day without being caught by their masters, by their lords. Um, so there's kind of a, a common saying, they said that the air in the town makes people free. And in the case of serfs, it quite literally can if you escape detection. Uh, towns also have their own courts and their own laws. Uh, and maybe even their own self-government. Um, some of these burgs will be communes, will be governed uh, by the merchants and the tradesmen who live there. Not always, but sometimes. So towns are in some ways more democratic than life on the manor in the countryside. Uh, in particular, we see the formation of these communes in places like Northern Italy, um, we will see this some in France, and we will also see it in uh, the Low Countries, particularly in what we would say today is Belgium. Uh, typically what happens in these communes is the townspeople rebel against the local ruler, uh, the local lord or the local bishop who controls the town, uh, and uh, they form their own governments. So who are these people who are living in the towns? Well. By and large, these are people who engage in trade or people who engage in manufacturing. Uh, so we have our merchants, uh, our businessmen. We have our artisans, so our tradesmen, our people who are engaged in what we would say are trades today, right? So butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, cobblers, tailors, right? All these people who have what we would call a craft, a trade. Uh, these people live in uh, the boroughs and the cities. So there's one other important detail we need to talk about about the boroughs and about these tradesmen, and that is about the guilds. Uh, so the guilds are organizations that control every aspect of production in a certain trade. So there is a butcher's guild, there is a baker's guild, there is a chandler's guild, chandlers are candle makers. Um, there's a cobbler's guild, there are grocer's guilds. Pretty much every trade has some kind of a guild and the guild decides how everything in that trade is run. So for example, let's say I make shoes, I'm a cobbler. Well, the guild tells me what kind of shoes I can make. The guild tells me how much I can charge for those shoes. 
the guild tells me how many apprentices I can employ to make those shoes. Um, the guild also decides who can open a shop and who can't, who can become a master in the guild and who can't. Uh, every aspect of production and sale and labor in a trade is controlled by a guild. So the guilds are extremely powerful. Uh, and in some of these cities, the guilds may also be the ones who control the government. Uh, so for example, in the city of London, the leaders of the guilds are the people who are also the aldermen who are running the city. Um, in London, you cannot be an alderman or a counselor if you are not first a member of one of these guilds. Um, so the guilds uh, police not only their own trades, but collectively they also work to form the government for many of these cities. All right, one last thing. When we talk about these cities, when we talk about towns, what are we talking about? How big are these places? Uh, by the standards of a modern city, pretty darn small. So a large trading city typically probably only has about 5,000 people. Uh, London, which is the largest city in England in this period, has a population of about 80,000. Uh, other important urban centers on the European continent like Bruges or Ghent have populations of about 40,000. The Italian cities do tend to be a bit larger. Uh, for example, cities like Venice, Florence, Naples, these typically have populations of about 100,000, um, but that's you know, much bigger than most of the rest of Europe. Uh, just to put this in perspective too, uh, the largest cities in Europe are not actually part of Christian Western Europe. Uh, the largest Christian city in this time period is Constantinople in the Byzantine Empire, which has a population of between 200 and 300,000. And the largest city in Europe is uh, actually in Spain, in Muslim-controlled Spain, and that's the city of Cordoba, which has some 400,000 people. Um, but really, there is nothing like Constantinople or Cordoba in, push, in Christian Western Europe in this period. So these are all actually pretty small places, at least by today's standards. So I hope that today you've got a good idea of what life is like for your average peasant and your townsperson in most of Western Europe in this period. Uh, and I hope you've got an idea of why the High Middle Ages is more successful and is a time of greater stability than the early Middle Ages. We're gonna move on on uh, our next lesson to talk about some of the intellectual developments like the creation of the universities and scholasticism. And then next week, we'll talk about some of the other important developments like knights and cathedrals and those kinds of things. So that's all I have for you today. And I hope to see you all again in person soon. So thank you. <laughs>